You are listening to the Southwestern American Choral Directors Association Connections podcast, where we will interview choral directors, leaders, and movers and shakers within our region. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Wall. We hope you enjoy these conversations. Please like and subscribe this YouTube channel for future content. Hello, Southwestern Region. Christopher Diaz is with me today and is the co-founder of the international touring group, The Exchange, which performed hundreds of shows for audiences in over 50 countries on six continents, notably opening for the Backstreet Boys in their 32 city in a world like this stadium tour. Probably also recognizable is Christopher's work on The Sing-Off on NBC as coach and arranger. There's much more to read if you'll go down to the description of this video to see the rest of Christopher's bio. And now I bring you Christopher Diaz. Okay, recording is going and here we go. I'm here with uh, Christopher Diaz. So thank you so much for joining us and carving out some time to tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Uh, Maybe you can start with uh, a little bit about your backstory, uh, your musical upbringing. How did you get into this world? Sure thing. So my name is Christopher Diaz. I use they, them pronouns. I actually was born in Virginia, in Newport News, Virginia. And I did not have an an especially musical upbringing in the sense of classical um, or formal training. I loved listening to music. I sang a lot with what was on the radio and wrote songs at my Casio and danced around, but I never really took formal music lessons until I got into high school, was kind of grabbed by a choral director of mine who said, you have a lovely voice, you gotta be in the musical. I was a six foot munchkin in the whiz and the rest is history. After that, I went to college, I went to Florida State University where I studied vocal performance, but I sang in choirs under Dr. Andre Thomas and Dr. Kevin Fenton, who really shaped a lot of how I see uh, music making in general. Um, but while I was at FSU, I joined the contemporary a cappella group All Night Yahtzee. Um, and that is really where I learned my specific niche in um, collaborative music and singing. Contemporary a cappella really just struck something in me. Um, that really very primal, sort of visceral feeling that you get when you're singing with other people. Um, and so I was really moved by that. So after college, I actually volunteered all through the contemporary acapella scene, especially in the nonprofit world for festivals like SoJam and NAC and BOSS. They all have really catchy acronyms. Um, and uh, from there, I worked on The Sing Off, which was a television show on NBC uh, for competing groups. I worked on the season that Pentatonix won. So I got to know them and kind of work with them and their developmental process as a vocal coach and arranger. And then after that, I made my own group called The Exchange with alumni of that season of the sing-off. We uh, really made it our goal to travel the world with our music rather than staying only in the U.S. And so we were lucky enough to travel to over 50 different countries using music as a form of outreach. We partnered with the State Department to do cultural ambassadorship work out in far-flung parts of the world. And um, we were lucky enough to tour with the Backstreet Boys across Europe and compete in the sing-off as a group. We got second place in uh, 2015. And since then, I have taught at uh, the um, the Miami Valley School in Dayton, Ohio, where I led the a cappella group Ars Nova um, and some choirs. And now I live in Maryland with my partner and my animals. And I am a freelance ranger, producer, writer, and coach. Wow, I did it. <laughs> you did, you did great. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a that's a very fascinating background, and uh, I think your some of your answers are going to be very different than some of our other guests. And so I'm really interested to see, you know, coming up with some of these other new questions, uh, what your answers are going to be. So yeah, I love that uh, that ver- that um, season of the sing off, and of course with Pentatonix was there, and you had a very prolific career after that. So um, yeah, looking forward to this. This is really cool. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit more then about what your role is going to be with us at Southwestern ACDA Conference in Denver. So I'm really excited to be joining this year as one of the directors of a high school a cappella honor choir. So when you think of honor choir at ACDA, you really think primarily of choral music, but um, I was really lucky to work with um, Jeff Murdoch, Dr. Murdoch in um, uh, Florida at NAC. And um, I was really uh, excited to kind of exchange ideas with him in the 
kind of collaboration and synergy of choral music and contemporary a cappella music. We are all singing after all, we're singing together. We're hoping for a uniform sound. We're hoping for a common goal and emotional expression. So I think he saw some of my work um, with contemporary a cappella groups and saw a lot of the similarities um, in what we do in choral music. So I'm excited to have a relatively large group of high school students. We're gonna learn a handful of really awesome songs, including some beatboxing. We're gonna develop our skills as solo singers, but also as, um, as ensemble singers who can kind of play the part as background vocalist of instrument and of support and harmony, harmony on the lead. So I'm really excited to, to share some of these skills with a group of people that I think traditionally um, think of ACDA as only about um, classical choral music. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a really neat untapped resource that we're we're digging into here for the conferences now that, you know, it's been it's been around for a, a long while now that uh, we just haven't given it the the platform I think it it, it duly needs. So, um I'm really glad that you're going to be spearheading one of these groups and uh, I think I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be fun. Okay, so um, as some of these questions go on, if they are geared more towards traditional choral music, then just spin it on its head and uh, sure. tell us uh, from your perspective, um, whether it be from the uh, contemporary acapella world or or however you'd like to answer. But uh, what's a piece of music that you think best embodies your personality? So I actually thought about this one really hard and I came up with an actual choral piece um, in uh, my undergrad. I remember singing Ray Fon Williams' Serenade to Music um, which includes uh, the text of Shakespeare, but it has, I think, like 12 different soloists, and they're all meant to be different, you know, sopranos, altos, basses, just all different textures and timbres, and he wrote these lines really specifically and beautifully for each of these voice types, um, and it's all atop this really lush, very romantic-sounding bed of... Uh, of a serenade, an ode to music in the abstract. You know, it just is like, oh music, you are so beautiful and you fill me up. Um, and whenever I hear that piece, I kind of, I bliss out. So I think <laughs> despite the fact that I, I think I, I have a Leo personality, I have a very relaxed, I think, inner sense of what I want music to sound like. That's cool. I love that piece too. That's, that's beautiful. It's um, so good. Okay, so what is a desert island? choral piece or otherwise that uh, only one that you could have with you until maybe you get saved. Okay. Until I get saved, this is a, this is a, an easy one for me. Um, I think it would be my soul's been anchored in the Lord, uh, Moses Hogan. I think not just because um, I think thematically, I mean, spiritually, if I was stranded on the Island, that's the sort of, I think sense of faith and hope that I would want to be guiding me, but also it just makes me feel empowered you know i feel like if any piece was going to make me feel like hanging on and waiting for my inevitable rescue that's one of them so i think that's what i go with great choice yeah um no. you're making me kind of second guess what i thought my choices would be. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. great, great. okay uh, do you have a then a particular philosophy of programming whether that be for your the own groups you're directing or maybe for the, an unacquired situation like this or um mm -hmm. however you'd like to answer that Absolutely. I actually feel really strongly about this specific point, because I think that even though we are not always singing in the same genres, I think that the storytelling we're striving to achieve is still always the same. And so I think that this philosophy can be shared beyond um, beyond choral music through acapella music. I have a lot of experience in the pop world. You know, I was in a boy band for many years um, touring with the Backstreet Boys. We had half an hour at the start of their set you know, and you have a crowd that's really there to see the Backstreet Boys, so they're not really there to see you. So when you're crafting a set, you, you know, you want to engage people, you want to talk about who you are artistically, like what your talents are, what your strengths are. Um, and you, I think you want to be direct, you really want to come directly with what makes you who you are. So in general, I think the philosophy for programming is start with something energetic that highlights strengths. Um, and end with something that is energetic and highlights strengths and try to do the most um, exploration and I think esoteria a little bit later in the set after you've established some trust. So an example of this is, um, you know, we did a lot of pop song covers, you know, that were shortened to kind of fit a mood. And we would think largely, you know, the first two or three songs would be upbeat songs meant to engage the crowd, have them kind of humming along with us. 
the fourth and fifth songs, maybe we can bring the energy down again. Fifth and sixth, we want to bring it up again. And here's the time where maybe we can put in an original tune if we have something that we've been working on, or we can do an off mic tune, or we could do something jazz, or just something that's way kind of experimental for what we've been setting up as a means of um, showing that we're not just a one trick, and then kind of head back into our our real strengths and skills for the end. That's an example for us. I think every group can kind of program based on the the feeling of the program itself, but we were we were meant to be a pop group. So that was our philosophy was to make people trust you by establishing kind of your strengths and energy, then show them, you know, your your special skills, so to speak, and then hone back in on your big strengths. But again, I'm thinking in the pop world, like what do I just want to watch when I'm, you know, standing around? <laughs> yeah, but those, those are all very transferable uh, ideas. Uh, in our in programming, no matter what genre you're you're trying to program for, um, yeah, the arc is is greatly important, and I think you just highlighted that. So yeah, thank you. Awesome. Uh, what kind uh, or what kind? Uh, what um, how would you describe? I guess is is the typical rehearsal under your direction. How would that look? Depends on what what stage we are with the song, but I think if, let's say we're starting with a new song. I really personally value understanding the big picture really clearly. Um, and I think I probably learned that when I was in college from Drs. Fenton and, and Dr. Thomas, um, the idea of looking at the whole piece first so that I can really contextualize all of the smaller choices. So rehearsal for me, especially if we're starting a song, um, in the contemporary world now, there are, so, there are so regularly demos, sung demos of the song. So I can play that out and we can follow along on the score and kind of hear the overall arc of the song um, and then I'll work with the group and kind of identifying sections of interest. You know, in most pop music, there's a form that we follow pretty closely. If the form is not following that, we identify why, you know. Um, but from there, once we understand, I think, the structure of the bigger piece, I, wanna, I want to understand why each section is doing what it's doing. Um, the arc is really important to me, especially because in the realm of contemporary acapella, I like to think of what we do as basically this, uh, we're just a bunch of the same instruments. So I like to think of us as a bunch of bassoons, say, um, and that, that always makes people laugh. But if you think about a bunch of bassoons playing an acapella chart of firework, you know, what would make it interesting? Um, and I think the thing that makes our interpretation of this interesting is that we're people and that we have a flexible instrument. So with acapella, I really like to have an emotional or kind of, um, a narrative choice about how I want to communicate an idea and then have the technical choice follow. So if I can say, you know, through the start of this intro, we're creating, you know, something misty and mysterious. And then in the verse here, we're creating, um, I don't know, something emerging from the fog. I think that's uh, an emotional and a narrative picture that we can see. And then we can make technical choices around, oh, maybe we'll sing more breathy, Obviously we're gonna sing pretty quietly. Maybe we can swell at the end of this phrase. But basically I like to establish not just the overall picture of the piece, but kind of my philosophy for how we're gonna look at it, which is um, I can tell you technical choices until I'm blue in the face. And by the way, they're usually in the score um, <laughs> and a good score, um, but why are we doing them? You're only gonna do them if you, if you attach them to some sort of why. So. Um, I like to have a, a rehearsal that starts very philosophical, but then we can start to pick apart at, uh, you know, at the piece, section by section. Yeah, I love those, uh, those tips. Um, now, here's something that may tie in um, to, to that same philosophy that you have for your programming and then also how you run your rehearsals, but how might you uh, direct a, an emerging choral leader, whether that be in the traditional choral world or a contemporary acapella, what pointers might you have for them? Oh, this is such a great question, especially because um, one of the things that I'm, I'm really excited about is I work every summer for Acapella Academy in California, which is um, a, 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 a training program for young singers. It's uh, for really aspiring young singers who want to experience um, a real high level of musicianship, performance, 
um, and camaraderie kind of through the contemporary acapella scene. So this is uh, my eighth year as a director at that. Um, and I always have a co-director and um, we always have a lot of returning campers who are seeking mentorship. And um, and um, and my partner is a, is a fantastic conductor and choral musician as well. So I've been learning and teaching about this a lot. And one of the big things that I am continuing to learn and to grow as a, as a director of groups is the idea of trust. I think um, when my groups um, trust me, that can mean a bunch of different things. It can mean that I model a lot. So I sing a lot so that they're hearing what I mean and that I can execute on what I mean. And it's not just an idea. Um, but it's also in like um, in time management and trusting and respecting their time. One of the things that I've been working on is when I say we're only going to do this one more time, I I have to mean that we're only going to do this one more time, you know. And I think it's very easy to be showing your group I'm passionate about this and I'm passionate about you, so we're going to do it a second and third time. But that kind of breaks their trust, you know. It it sets up a, a relationship where they think, oh well, I'm just hearing if it's the last time. And I really want to take their time and their attention seriously. So I think um, planning, over planning, and having a real idea for what you want your rehearsal to look like, um, but but establishing trust with your group that you'll make mistakes, um, but that you're going to show them and be engaged with them on the process. I think it's really important, and that kind of supersedes skill and talent to some extent. If your group believes in you, you know, you can really put, overcome a lot of barriers. And I think contemporary acapella is a great, um, kind of a great uh, space to experiment with that. You know, you have a lot of amateur singers in, in many cases who are not in the music program, who are basically learning sort of distilled and synthesized ideas from a lot of music majors, or they're just figuring it out as they go, you know, with these charts. And I think if you can, create trust that we're going to build this together and we're going to figure out this music together and have fun doing it. You can really overcome a lot of barriers. Um, you know, we had people in my group that, that didn't, that just straight up didn't read music. Um, and we didn't have part tapes back then. Um, so, you know, in rehearsal, we were banging out notes for them and they were recording them and they were going home and memorizing them. And, you know, my group made it to ICCA finals three years in a row. So, you know, I think that the, the talent, and a lot of the other resource gaps can be overcome by, by a community and culture. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you said there about the authenticity, trust in the, in the process. Those are all uh, really great takeaways, I think. Um, so now burn, burnout is a, a big topic of the day. Um, you know, we're, we all battle it, work-life balance and all of those things. So what, what do you do to relax or fight burnout? That's a great question. I feel burned out a lot. I think one of the things that helps me is recognizing that my creativity, especially my musical creativity, is just, it's just kind of lucky that this is how I, uh, I am the most creative. It's just really a, a set of like circumstances that led to me becoming a musician. Um, definitely uh, an instinct and some gifts, but um, I am more creative than I am able to make music, if that makes sense. And so um, I like to, I'm learning to let my creativity flow in other ways. I'm, it's as simple as like just coloring in a coloring book or, you know, like painting a little, you know, <laughs> sculpture or, uh, uh, you know, you know, anything physical, um, some way to be creative, but not in a musical way. I also love to play video games for a bit of escapism and um, and even in like an esoteric kind of philosophical way in like taking in other people's art, you know, and other people's approach to creativity and the score and their uh, what they're making. Um, also moving my body really helps walking around with the dog. Um, but the last and I think maybe most business minded idea would be to just really plan. Um, I have a mind where if I can plan my projects out in small chunks um, and uh, really see the, the big picture, as I mentioned in my rehearsal philosophy. That really helps me tame the anxiety of the project and uh, feel like I can hold myself accountable for smaller, you know, smaller chunks of the thing. Yeah, for sure. And I, I like what you said about kind of redirecting your creative energies, because as musicians, it's sometimes difficult for us to shut that off. Um, and I don't, yeah. think we, I don't think maybe we should. Um, so I, yeah. I kind of like what you said there about redirecting that energy to, to maybe something else that's um, uh, different uh, in, in field from music so that you can sort of get away from the, the day in, day out work that you do in the music 
world, but using that creative energy for something else that's going to take your brain away, but also check the box for the, the creativity that you need to express. Definitely. And also, I think, you know, something that I don't, I don't know if we talk about it in the, I think we talk about it in the abstract, but I don't know if we like really broach with young singers, like in the literal sense, like the aspect of singing being for pleasure um, and creativity being for um, like the, like the, the the, the abstract idea of making me feel good. And I think that creativity is something that we often try to funnel through um, the lens of, of like productivity and uh, kind of like result. But something that I'm learning, especially as I get a little bit older, is I just really enjoy making things and I really miss that. So I've taken up uh, like tie dyeing, I tie dyed the shirt, you know, I like to paint my nails a lot. They're little things, but that sort of very um, childlike almost sense of just creating something just to do it um, is something I really want to bring into music. So I have to make sure I have access to it outside of music as well, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that. And, you know, it, it's hard for us because we, we say, well, m music is not just what I do, it's who I am. Um, and so we, we personally identify with that. And that's that's great, but I, I think we also have to realize that there are other ways that we can express ourselves and, and sort of set that aside for a moment to give our brain and, and souls a break. Absolutely, well said. Yep. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're gonna move into this Acela Rondo round, if you're okay with that. And uh, I'm ready. Yeah, I don't um, share all of these questions uh, ahead of time. Uh, usually it's just the the one question that I share that takes a little more thought, but um, we're going to try to shoot from the hip here a little bit. So what is the worst job that you've ever had outside of music? Uh, I worked at Wawa. It was fine. Uh, I mean, not, it, they, they, they weren't rude to me or anything, um, but it was it was hard. People are really, they're really, people are very serious about their food. That's how I'm going to say it. <laughs> so so uh, I think that's kind of a regional thing. So So explain to others who don't know, what is Wawa? So basically, in the long line of kind of um, full service gas stations, uh, you know, if you maybe if you have like a Sheets near you, or um, I think in the Midwest, there's um, Dukes or, or Sandy's, it's like a name like that. There are lots of these like big gas stations um, that have like kitchens inside and um, it was one of those and I just needed some cash, but I was, it, well, it was a lot of, it was a lot. <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, I understand that completely. So, okay. So what's your guilty pleasure bad food to eat? Bad food to eat. I could clear out uh, a whole gallon jug of goldfish today. If it was in front of me, I could, you know, those like big cartons, no questions asked. I could eat that whole thing today. I'm obsessed with goldfish. Unique answer. Okay. Nobody's come to me with uh, goldfish before. So that's great. <laughs> Uh, if you had any other job to do besides being a musician of some kind, what might that be? Uh, so I joke about this, um, but the president, I would love to, I would love to not have to do all of the work to, you know, lobby and, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, become a politician. But if I could just pick a job, I would love to take on a really tough job, see it from the other side do everything I could to make a difference and then, you know, maybe switch back to being a music teacher after that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's ambitious. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Why not? If I got any other job, I mean, you know. Yeah, exactly. If you have the choice, might as well. Right. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So a choice here, what is the scariest moment in your life or what's the, your biggest phobia? Ooh, biggest phobia. What's really great is the older I get, the, the more kind of abstract my fears get. Um, <laughs> they're less focused on things like spiders. Um, um, was the first question, what's the scariest movie I've ever seen? Uh, scariest moment. Oh, scariest moment. Oh, oh, okay. Um, once I was traveling with uh, my band, The Exchange, and we were flying to Juneau, Alaska, and we, uh, there was like a, a snowstorm. And so we had to circle the airport several times, but after the, st the snow cl <laughs> cleared full enough, uh, well enough for us to see, we saw that the Juno airport strip is actually, um, it, there, it's water on both sides of it. So you're landing on like a tiny little strip with water on both sides and the plane 
was like actively banging back and forth as we are going towards the street. Uh, needless to say, it all worked out okay. But I remember that being the one time in a plane where I thought this might, this might be it, and I might be swimming with salmon tonight. Wow, that is scary. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, and you, I guess you have to have an expert, expert pilot. <laughs> Yeah, whoever was, they nailed it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Okay, um, here's the one that I share prior to. So if you could have any four people on the proverbial Coral Mount Rushmore, who would you choose? This one is really, really hard. So I tried, I think I decided to go just totally based on my own discretion. Um, I think I would put like, um, for the modern time, I think I would put Eric Whitaker. Um, I think for romantic time, um just my preference maybe brahms um i think we would need um someone um oh geez and, and then the other two this is this is a tough one for me i think these have to be kind of swings so can we change the mountain every few years why not it's it's, it's your mount rushmore you know because i think people like kirby shaw definitely deserve a spot up there um you know or someone like um gene pearling i mean so but then you have to rotate i think you know they're just <laughs> innumerable so i think those would be my four but i would rotate uh, i said moses hogan andre thomas there are so many amazing yeah for sure maybe we could do a a um a mount rushmore that's uh an led screen now where we could just cycle it <laughs> like the billboards now an idea just a facade and then every you know year or something we change that's actually a pretty cool idea yeah there you go okay i like that um yeah changing every every cycle or so and and i like that you kind of uh hit hit a couple in in the modern time and then romantic era so yeah, yeah. good answer what is something that you spend way too much money on Nail polish. So um, in my, uh, it, for some reason in this later time in my life, I, um, I just like am really appreciating, um, especially through a lot of my students, seeing the expression of gender as really unique, um, and very, um, I think very straightforward and simple, and I really love the beautiful colors that I can just look at on my fingers all the time. Um, it's just like a kind of like a fixation thing. So I spent a lot of money on nail polish just to paint my nails so that I have like beautiful things to look at, you know, while I'm sitting on the train or while I'm, you know, uh, you know, just doing whatever. Um, and it's brought me a lot of pleasure. So that's my odd answer. Okay, yeah, right on. Do what makes you happy. Um, what is a secret talent that most people might be surprised to learn about you? Secret talent? Uh, surprised? I don't know if they'd be surprised, but I, I think I'm a, pr a pretty good cook. Um, I have noticed in the past year or two, I'm, I'm making dinner, like I'm making recipes that I've made in the past and I'm not Googling them or <laughs> needing to look at my book anymore. And so I'm like, oh, I think this means I'm actually mastering these recipes. I'm making changes on my own you know, um, that aren't just flavor, they're like textural and, uh, you know, so I, I feel like I'm a pretty good cook. Um, I've worked really hard on that, so, yeah. Great, yep, I'd love for you to, to cook for all of us at some point, that'd be great. Heck yeah, maybe I'll bring something with me. Yeah, my, I was gonna say, <laughs> the wheels are turning. <laughs> right, well, that'll really entice people to come and watch you work. You have a Heck yeah, <laughs> I'll bring cookies. Right. Um, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? This this one is so difficult, but um, I think I would have um, shape shifting, the ability to like just like experience different like being in a different body, um, maybe being a bird, being a different person, being a rock. I think it would be really. <laughs> yeah, that was going to be my question: is it animate or inanimate? But I think yeah. you're okay. So either one. Yeah, as long as I can change back, I would love to. I'd love to be a lava lamp for an hour or two, you know, just to see. <laughs> a lava lamp. I love that. Okay. Yeah, you have movement there too. That's great. Okay. Well, congratulations. You've achieved Tempo Presto there. So we've made it through the Acceleronda round. Now back to, yeah. to Tempo Primo. Here we go. Okay. So uh, what is, uh, um, or who is another choral musician that you'd like to lift up? Oh, this is an easy, easy answer. Today, I want to lift up my good friend, Robert Dietz, who is going to be uh, one of the other high school a cappella honor uh, choir conductors. He is an amazing, amazing composer um, and uh, writer and artist, and he's such an interesting um, 
and uh, compassionate and thoughtful educator. He's just such a cool guy to be around. And I think he writes some of the most beautiful and insightful pieces, um, many of which are published. So go check them out. But yeah, I'm a big fan of Rob Dietz. I call him Robbie Baby. We worked together on the Sing Off um, many, many years ago. Um, and so, yeah, snaps to, to Robert. I hope everybody checks him out. Great choice. Okay, so what are your goals for the next year, 2024? What are you looking forward to the most projects you're working on? That's a great question. This year, um, I'm really excited to be uh, developing a little bit more of that thing I was talking about before, creativity and creation and play for its own sake. Um, so I'm in the early stages of a recording only group where we'll just record beautiful things that make us happy and release them or not. Um, I am uh, in the middle stages of an EP of original music, which I'm excited to be releasing. Um, and I'm looking forward to arranging and teaching at Acapella Academy again. Um, so it's a good year. There's some other things, but I can't talk about them yet. Um, so. Well, we'll look forward to the, the, the secret things and uh... <laughs> And we'll also look forward to to uh, checking out your your music as that gets uh, released into your your uh, new releases. So that that'll be cool. Um, Thank you kindly. Where along that line, where can people find you uh, online? Where can they get in touch with you if they want to connect? Uh, email, social media, website. Best place to reach me is going to be via email at heychristopherdiaz at gmail.com. Heychristopherdiaz at gmail.com. I am in the last phases of a website redesign, which I'm really pumped about, and that will be heychristopher.com. Um, so those are the two ways to hit me. Perfect. Anything that uh, I didn't cover today that you'd like to, to share with our membership? The, nothing that I can think of um, other than um, I'm a huge Star Wars fan and um, I've been recently watching the Ahsoka series and my mind has just been just been totally blown. I'm loving it. And um, the music in that is really fascinating and beautiful. And so um, even if you're not a big Star Wars fan, you should check out um, Kevin Kiner's amazing score. It is uh, it's it just spans so many. Uh, so many centuries and references it's vocal it's um, electronic it's just really fascinating yeah i love I, i'm all caught up now and i love all the tie-in <laughs> of all of the animated series and you know everything so it's uh it's been been really cool to watch that that series so uh, we share that that connection there that's awesome <laughs> okay um, okay well uh thank you for again carving out some time to to share a little bit about yourself with our membership i, I know people are going to be Really excited, our directors, to um, to get their students uh, enrolled in the Contemporary Acapella under your direction uh, and with Rob Dietz and to, um, to to really get this new launch going for just a really innovative new uh, thing for the, the American Choral Directors Association. As far as we're concerned, I think this is going to be the start of something beautiful. So thank you so much for joining me. Well, I am so excited. Um, ACDA was where I first saw the Swingle Singers, who became the Swingles, who have been one of the hugest influences on me as a contemporary a cappella musician. So in a strange way, uh, you know, the American Choral Directors Association was around um, and inspiring and educating me in this way before they even maybe knew they were. So I'm happy to be giving back and I can't wait to see everyone soon. Love it. Love it. Okay.